Hey everybody, today Rado runs through Freedom, the Underground Railroad, which is a cooperative game all about the brave men and women who ran and operated the Underground Railroad in the 1800s, which was devoted to helping fugitive runaway slaves escape from southern plantations, you know, and make it, you know, across the U.S., across the border into Canada where slavery was outlawed and they would be safe. And, you know, this is a fairly heavy topic, you know, heavy subject matter, but it's also a very, very good, respectful, solid, cooperative game. I'm going to try and demonstrate that today in this run-through, and so let's jump right into it. Now, uh, the, the board is set up for a two-player game, and in this game, I will be the preacher, and Jen will be the conductor. There's actually, as you can see over there, several different characters that players could play, and me, the preacher, is an abolitionist preacher. My special ability is I can basically buy abolitionist cards for one dollar less than normal. Basically, it'd be, as a preacher, it's easier for me to recruit um, and, you know, and, and help build the abolitionist cause. I also have a special one-time ability that basically if there's ever a really bad event card in the, in the abolitionist queue, like this one over here, that is so bad it's going to destroy us, I can basically flip this card, you see I, it's a one-time use, and remove that card from the queue. So I can preach about it and, and get people to make it go away, but I can only do that once. Jen, meanwhile, is the conductor character, and you can see very much inspired by a, a Harriet Tubman type. And let's see, so basically Jen's special power is she can move two slaves one space each during the action phase, and that's above and beyond what you can normally do. So Jen can really help um, you know, push the slaves to freedom much, much quicker as a conductor. And then her special ability is one time in the game, she can basically flip this to have used her power to have five movement points to, to move like one slave five spaces or five one space or however she wants. That is hugely powerful. Although, you know, mine is really powerful too. And, you know, we are, in this game, we're the team trying to, well, basically, well, basically, in this game, in a two-player game, we have to save 10 slaves. We have to get 10 slaves freed to Canada. We're playing on normal difficulty, by the way. If we want to play on hard, it would be 13, but we need to get 10. Now, and we have to do this before up 16 slaves are lost, and that's a euphemism for died. Um, so if 16 slaves die, we lose. Um, and also, the game has a, has a, a timer built in. This deck of the slave market is a timer, and if we can't finish the game before all the slave market cards have been played, we lose as well. So we have a timer. We also have uh, you know this you know a limit of how many slaves we can lose before we lose. And what we have to do, we have to do two things. We have to free ten slaves, and we have to sway public opinion to the abolitionist cause over the course of the 1800s. I mean, this game starts in the year 1800, ends in the year 1865, and we cannot have considered ourselves having won unless we have sl swayed public opinion enough against the act of slavery. So that's what we're trying to do. And enough talk, let's just actually try to do that. Okay, so there's a nice little uh, order of play summary right here on the board. Actually, everybody has one on their cards as well. It's a little bit more detailed. But the first thing that happens every round is, well, first of all, we have to roll the slave catcher dice and the movement dice and see what they are up to. So we take this. This is the die for which of the slave catchers may or may not move this round. And this is how far they move. So let's see what happens. All right, the orange one is going to move two spaces east. Okay. Now we come up here. Oh, and I should say, by the way, these wooden pawns representing the uh, the five slave catchers, those were a Kickstarter bonus. If you buy the game you know, in Retail Channel, you're just going to get these little uh, cardboard tokens, which are perfectly fine. They, they, they work okay. But I, uh, I'm going to use the, the actual pawns just because I figured they'd be easier to read on camera. And so the orange one is moving two spaces easterly. If I come in here and zoom, you can see at the beginning of the game, the orange one is set is a little symbol for him, in Chicago. And because I've rolled, he's going to move two east. And he follows his orange road. So he goes one from Chicago to Cincinnati, and then two from Cincinnati to Ripley. And that's it. So the first thing that happens is that one of these guys potentially moves. It's possible, where is it? It's possible that we roll this symbol, which means nobody moves. And sometimes you are really desperate because they're about to catch some slave you're trying to get across the border. And um, you're hoping, oh, please, a one in six chance, don't let any of them move, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, that, that, that really comes into play more later on. But what's interesting is now, because this guy has moved over here, he's kind of left this whole corridor open. So Jen and I might want to, 
early on in the game, try to you know direct the slaves through the uh, Underground Railroad up here. In, in this direction because it's kind of wide open. And you know what, I should say right up front, just for you know, maybe uh, you know, non-Americans who aren't as familiar with American history as Americans should be, this is not an actual railroad that runs through a series of tunnels underground. It's not that at all. The Underground Railroad is a euphemism for basically a network of, of roads and paths and safe houses throughout the southern and northern states that the fugitive slaves used to stay hidden from the, uh, from the slave catchers and from the authorities trying to make their way to freedom. So, okay, enough about that. So we've done the first thing, the slave catcher phase. Now we go on to the planning phase where each player gets to plan. Now I didn't say at the beginning of the game, everybody starts with eight bucks and we cannot pool our money because you know, effectively we're in different parts of the country and you know, the, there were no ATMs or you know, easy bank transfers back then. So I've got my eight bucks, Jen's got her eight bucks and now we are going to plan where we can spend our money to buy tokens. Now at the beginning of the game, we are in the years 1800 to 1839. So we can only buy these tokens. But as the game goes on, we get more and more tokens we can buy. So we can buy any of these and every player has the option to buy zero, one, or two. And, you, and if you can, you want to buy as many as you can because they give you abilities. Support tokens, you can see the row for support, these are the most expensive, 10 bucks a pop. Uh, neither Jen nor I can afford one right now, but we have to buy these. To win the game, we, in a two player game, have to buy two plus three more, plus two more. We have to buy seven. We have to pay, we have to raise and pay 70 bucks because having bought all of these will represent us having swayed public opinion against slavery enough to consider a win. Um, so we, we have to put a lot of money into it. So we're always, in addition to actually trying to you know, move the slaves up north and avoid the slave catchers, we're also trying to raise funds. Now, the other things I can buy, I could pay two bucks to buy a conductor chit. And the more of these I have, the more slaves. It represents you know, my you know, ability to tap into the Underground Railroad network and get more slaves moved through sa to safety. Each one of these cost me two bucks. And the last shit I could get are fundraising shits. Now these are totally free and these are a way to raise more money. And so I can't afford these, but I'm going to take two shits. I think I'm just going to spend four bucks and take two railroad shits and start getting some slaves on the move. So that cost me four bucks. There's my five. I get one change. And my planning is done. And now Jen, she's going to do the same thing. She's got money. I think she's going to do something slightly different. She will get one um, which will cost her two bucks and she will get some fundraising so that she can try to raise some more cash. So the fundraising is free, the conductor only costs two, and so she paid two bucks and she's got six bucks left. Because remember, we're trying to save up to ten so we can buy those support tokens. And now, this planning phase, of course, like I said, people cannot pool their money, but you do want to work together. You, and, and you know, a lot of, this is when you actually plan out what you're going to do for your entire move. You know, which slaves are we going to move? How are we going to avoid the slave catchers? Which abolitionist cards are we going to try to buy based on how much money we've got left over, et cetera, et cetera. And um, so I'm just kind of skipping through that. I, I'm actually just kind of playing by gut. But normally, you know, we would evaluate what's up here. Which of these do we want to buy? Where are the slave catchers? Who's going to go first? Who's going to go second? Because I, you know, me, I've got the first player marker. So I will actually do all of my actions before Jen does hers. But, um, you know, so there's a lot of planning that goes on. And as the game goes on, the situation becomes very complex, very dire. There's a lot of pressure on you and you've spent a lot of time planning. But at the early days, you know, things are kind of wide open. It's not too tough. So anyway, we're done with the planning phase. Now let's move on to the action phase. Starting with the lead player, I can use my the abilities of my role, my preacher, the role. I can play up to two tokens and I just happen to have two tokens. And I can buy an abolition card. And I can do those things in any order I want. And there's actually a little bit more detail about all this on, you know, the player card. Uh, right. But let's see, what am I going to do? Well, first of all, remember one of the things I can do is I can use my role special abilities. One of those special abilities is every turn I get a dollar for free, you know, just kind of fundraising. And in fact, actually all the characters have this ability to get at least one dollar. Some characters, so there's like a rich guy and uh, somebody else, some richer characters, they actually have the ability to raise more money. They can actually raise two dollars this turn. But so I'm definitely going to take my one dollar. And my other special ability is, remember, I get to buy one of these cards and I get to buy them for $1 cheaper than normal. So this would normally cost me three, but it'll really cost me two. These ones, which cost one, I could get for free. So that's actually really, really great. So I'm going to do one of those. And 
And then after I'm done with all that, and plus I'm going to play chits, I'll probably go on ahead and play both of these chits and get some slaves on the move. In fact, what the heck, let's start with that. Hmm. Right. Okay, so I'm going to play the first of the two chits I want to play, and this basically gets removed from the game. What this is saying is, I can move three slaves, one space each. And they have to be three separate slaves. Now, of course, these cubes, these you know, unpainted wooden cubes, which honestly I think is probably the most sensitive way to represent slaves as, as some kind of physical object. You know, they're not painted black or white. They're just, you know, natural nude wooden cubes. And so I can move three of them from any plantation of my choice. You know, basically I'm reaching out to the network. I'm helping three of these slaves escape from plantations and start moving north. And I think for starters, what the heck, I will just go on ahead and move this one here. I'll move this one here, and I'll move this one. You know, this is where we started. I could go up here. I'll move over here to Charleston. Okay, so that was my first action. And now um, I'm gonna get to play another one. So I'm gonna be able, now I could move these three one more space, or I could move other ones out of the plantations into new spaces as well. Uh, like for instance, I could, well, let's see. Now one thing you can't do is I cannot move a slave. There can only be one, there's only one safe house here. And there's not enough, it'd be too dangerous to try and um, you know, house multiple fugitive slaves here. So I cannot move another one into this space. And that's a big, big part of this game. This game is really kind of like managing traffic as you try to maneuver people around and, and try not get stuck up, watching out for the blockers, you know, the, these, these, uh, the, the slave catchers and all that. Let's see, but I, am, I have another one. I might as well play it. So, hmm, I think I will move this guy up here. That's my first of three moves. And now, because, oh wait, no, no, actually, no, I'm gonna do it instead. I will move this guy over here. I'll move him from there, from whatever safe house is, into St. Louis. Now, two things happen when I move this. Because this is a, uh, this is, you know, there's, there's an active community. Um, the, because there's a, there's a slave now hiding out here, the abolitionist movement was able to generate $2 income. So I get two more bucks for having moved him. That's my first of three. But uh, something else happens. Because this spot is on the purple roads, that means the purple slave catcher moves one space in that direction. So, because you know, I moved into purple, this guy moves one step closer. He, get, he hears a rumor that there's a slave over in, in St. Louis and starts moving in that direction. All right, so that's my first of three. And now, um, and now I cannot move him again. I cannot move the same guy multiple times with my one shit. So he's moved. Um, I am gonna have this guy who I moved out. I'm gonna pay a dollar and send him on a ship so that's my second, and you can see this is he's out at sea, and he can uh, he can land in Philadelphia, New York. He can't land in New York because he'd get caught immediately by this slave catcher or Boston. So I've got that guy on the move, and now I get to move one more. <laughs> and uh, I will move another guy um, out of you know, so he can start. So we can start maybe trying to push some guys up in this direction. So now. Those are my two chits. Um, I've done one of my special abilities. My, um, I also get to buy one of these cards. If I wanted, I could use my special one-time action, and um, but I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna save that for when I really need it. Let's see, but let's go ahead and buy one of these cards. Remember, my special ability is I buy them for cheaper. Now, in a three or four player game, this card uh, will always, if, if nobody buys this card, it will get removed from the game. And you know, and then other cards will slide down and new cards will come out. In a two player game, both of these cards are going to get removed. And so I think it's really important. I mean, these are both good cards here that would help us a lot. So uh, chances are I'm gonna buy one and Jen's gonna buy one. And of course this would be something that we would be planning. Be, well, should we buy one of these or should we buy one of these because they'd be more powerful at stuff or, you know, or whatever, or better for, our certain t for the timing of the moment. But since both these cards are gonna go away and they're both good, I'm gonna buy one right now. I'm gonna buy Theodore Weld, who was an architect of the abolitionist movement. Weld also co-authored the American Slavery as it is, testimonial of a thousand witnesses. Okay, so I am basically going to recruit this guy. It would cost me one, but because I'm the preacher, it costs me nothing. And I now get to, now this is an instant. Most of these cards, there's three types of cards that can appear in the line. Instance, that you, um, you recruit them and then you immediately use their ability and then the card is removed from the game. And then these ones, which are called reserve cards, these uh, silver ones, when you buy them, they don't activate immediately. Instead, you hold them in reserve and can use them at a later date when the timing is right. 
And then there's these red ones. These are the bad things. And right now, the first, and there happened to be one in our first draw, the Fugitive Slave Act, which is the, the law of the land that actually allows, you know, basically bounty hunters like these, you know, these slave catchers. Or if you've seen the movie 12 Years a Slave, I mean, you, you kind of know about some of this already. Um, you know, this was the Fugitive Slave Act that, you know, makes it illegal for slaves to seek their freedom and illegal for people to help them. And it's why we are, have to be underground. And now this is a bad event. What's going to happen is, now this is, a t this is a time bomb for us. This will result, when this card is removed from the board, up to three slaves in spaces next to slave catchers will immediately be captured. So when this explodes, basically, not only will the slave catchers, um, you know, it will, uh, you know, not only will they be able to capture where they are, but they will, their reach will extend to all the neighboring areas. And we know this is coming because what's going to happen is over the course of the next couple of rounds, this is going to slide down and eventually get removed from the game. And then that's when this happens. So we have to be very, very careful about our timing. We have to make sure that when this is going to happen, we don't have any slaves in areas adjacent to these slave, slave catchers. And that is going to be hard because, of course, every time we move into these colored roads, they move towards us. In fact, it might make sense, as crazy as it is, for me to buy this right now. Because, you know, by my special abilities, I could get these for free. And if I don't buy one of them, it'll be removed from the game. But if I buy this right now, instead of costing three, it'll cost two. But at this moment, oh, actually, not quite. At this moment, one slave is within range. But, you know, I could have bought that card before I moved him. And then that, that Fugitive Slave Act wouldn't affect this at all. If I bought it right now, when there are no slaves um, next to... You know, th this guy, he could have moved over here, which made this yellow guy move. There are no slaves at all. They're in a space adjacent. Oh, wait, that's not true. This guy who's on the water is adjacent to the brown guy. Arr. Shoot. All right. Well, you know what? Um, I think we'll just be careful. I'll have moved this over here like I originally did, so yellow didn't move. And we'll just have to bear this in mind that in a couple of rounds, this is going to trigger. Because we're not going to spend our money to make it trigger early. Okay. So instead, I'm going to buy one of these. I will... Just going ahead and what the heck, I will buy this one, uh, the Southern Church Correspondence. You know, churches uh, were often one of the few places slaves were allowed to congregate, allowing mail to be passed along. And this special ability is having bought this, which I got for free. Each player receives $2 from the bank. Okay, so um, each player gets 2 bucks, and it didn't cost us anything. So it was definitely a good purchase for me. Um, all right, now I have used my two chits. I have bought a uh, you know an abolitionist card, and I have let's see I, I played my two chits. I bought an abolitionist card. I gave the benefit of my roll, and I'm not going to use my one-time ability now. If I wanted, if I didn't want to do anything this turn, instead I could just pass, not do anything, and instead take three bucks later in the game, four bucks, and late in the game, five bucks. Sometimes you want to do that because you're desperate for cash to buy the support. But as it is right now, I'm pretty happy with that. You know, I made the two bucks. By getting in St. Louis, I made two more bucks um, because of that uh, Southern Church correspondence. And now my turn is over, and now it is Jen's turn. Okay. And so, let's see. First of all, she'll use one of her two chits and move three more slaves, three spaces. Let's see. So she will move one. And now this moved into the brown. So brown says, hey, what's going on down there? And starts getting closer. One. Two. And three. And now this hit purple, so purple gets moving closer and closer. Now, um, Jen's got another chip, but this is a fundraising one. The way this works is, whenever you play this, for every slave that is in a southern location, you know, the green dot, um, Jen will make one dollar in fundraising because the more slaves that are on the run, the more money she can raise for the cause. And right now, so she did it right now. She'd get one, two, three, four, five bucks. Now, this one doesn't count because it's out sea, so it's not in a, in a green spot. So that'd be five bucks she'd get. But you know what? I think before she's going to play this, because remember, she can do this stuff in any order she wants. First of all, don't forget, she gets $1 income for her action. She can move, she, every round, she gets to move two slaves, one space each, as, as a free special ability she's got. So she'll move this guy here, and she will move... The, uh, this one over here, and now that brings yellow um, closer. So she used her special ability. There are now more slaves, um, you know, out 
out and out, you know, out so we can do more. She just basically made it so she can raise two more funds. But before she's going to do the fundraising, she'll spend one dollar and buy Theodore Weld or Theodore Weld, which is an ability move one slave from any plantation to a to a southern space with no effect. Oh shoot! But look at this. All the spaces out of the southern plantations are full. Jen should have done this before. Let's see. Let's uh, let's rewind a bit. You know, Jen's special ability. She moved these two, right? So before she used her special ability to move two, she she um, bought. You know, she recruited Theodore Weld. This lets her move one slave from any plantation to a southern space. And so she will move this one to a southern space. Uh, this was for Theodore Weld. And now the interesting thing is, you'll notice it says with no effect. And that means when we moved into this space, it did not draw yellow any closer because no effect meant we could ignore the fact that normally yellow would move closer. So Jen bought Theodore Weld, then she's going to use her special ability, which lets her move two more. So she will move this guy here and she will move, um, <laughs> let's see. Well, see now, again, all the spaces are blocked, so she can't move anybody else out of a plantation. So she's got to move somebody forward. She doesn't want to move anybody out of the southern states, though, because she wants to maximize her fundraising. But she can't get any more, so what is she going to do? Now, like if she moved this guy over here, yellow would be blocking the way, but now this guy can move up to rip, you know. So a lot of the thinking of this game, a lot of the logistics is trying to move in such a way that you manipulate these guys so that they will get out of the way. Um, I guess it's not going to be too terribly painful if Jen moves this guy here. Now that means yellow is going to move over to Cleveland again. Okay. And so now she's done with her movement because she can't play anymore, but there's now a space open so another slave could come out of this plantation in, in um, Alabama, I guess. Okay. So Jen has played one of her two chits. She's used her special ability, moving two and getting a buck. She's hired, you know, she's recruited somebody, and now she's got one more chit. She's gonna play it, her fundraising chit. She gets one dollar for every slave in a southern location. That's one, two, three, because you can see St. Louis has a green background. It's odd. Ripley over here, Ripley, Ohio, I think this is Ohio, yeah, has no colored background, so it does not count as a northern or southern state. Washington, D.C. also doesn't have a colored background, so that's important. But anyway, Jen gets one, two, three, four, five, six, seven dollars from that fundraising. So that, and you know, and now this is the kind of thing that Jen and I would have coordinated. We say, I would have said up front, hey, I'm going first. I'll just get a bunch, um, you, know, it, you know, into play. You can move some more and then you can do fundraising. You'll have a lot of money. So at the next turn, you can buy some support. You know, that's the kind of coordination that we do as a cooperative game. So anyway, Jen has, is finished with her turn. She's played her two chits. She's used her special ability. She's recruited somebody. And so now we're done with the action phase and it's time for the slave market phase. Deliver slaves to the plantations. And I haven't talked about this. Like I said, this is the timer. This is the current mark, the slave market. You can see there's a little picture of you know, you know, artwork from the time. These are slaves for sale. And now these six are going to get bought by the plantations. And in fact, we just now we get to choose which of the which translations these six cubes go into these six slaves. And um, I guess I'll have two of them go here because I've opened up a spot. And with that, I'll just I'll just um, distribute them evenly. And now you can see there's one two three four five six one two three four five six six more spaces. And what's going to happen is at the end of the next round, and this card goes away. At the end of the next round, we're going to need to have seven spaces free. Because there's going to be seven slaves on the auction the next round. And so if we don't have seven spaces, if we haven't emptied out seven spaces um, in these plantations for them, instead of them going to the plantation, they will go up to the slaves lost. And we will start to basically lose lives and you'll get closer to losing. So this is another bit of huge amount of pressure. We always have to keep these plantations constantly drained so there's room so that these slaves who are basically on their way over won't you know, be lost, for it, which is just like a, a nice way to put it. Okay, so anyway, we've done the slave market phase and now we move on to the land phase. Trigger, discard, the last abolitionist cards, uh, slide and fill cards, uh, you know, pass leave player, marker, and if the last slave market has been delivered, the game is over. So, if these cards were still here, they'd be removed from the game. These ones all slide down, new ones come out. We're, we're not drawing from these decks because we're still in the early. And oh, lovely, a, another, we have two bad events, Elijah Lovejoy and another good event. Let's see, what's Elijah? Alrighty, this was um, 
Lovejoy, editor of the anti-slavery paper, the Alton Observer, was shot by, plo by a pro-slavery mob as they attempted to burn down his warehouse. Fundraising tokens only draw funds from large cities. That makes thematic sense. After I can imagine after that happened, it was going to be tougher to actually do fundraising operations because everybody would be afraid of being killed. So that's that's kind of heavy. Um, now, interestingly, if you know if I drawn this and I had drawn another bad event, only one bad event will ever get added onto the uh, queue. So if an if I drawn another bad event, it would have been held off to the side. I would have drawn until there was another bad event, and then it would have gotten shuffled back in. But it is we've got these two things, and now this is going to be in effect until removed from the queue. Now, so it's actually a good thing that Jen did some fundraising last turn because now fundraising is not going to be very good for us until either this goes away and people you know lose their fear over the assassination of uh, Eliza, Eliza Lovejoy, or or we can buy this card to remove it from the queue earlier and then its effect will go away and maybe that's something we'll do. But anyway, so we've uh, refilled that. Um, all the, you know, the slave uh, markets come down. Hey, there's a new one. One, two, one, two, three. And um, Jen will become the first player. And we start again with the slave catcher phase. Let's see what the slave catchers are going to do. And um, orange again is going to. Did I just roll this twice in a row? Okay, no, okay. Orange is going to go east again. So orange, he's going to go two spaces east. One, two. He, he's got, you know, he's rushing over here. He's definitely blocking this guy. This guy's in danger. If he moves over here, orange will come over and capture him. So. That's done, and now we go back to planning, and now Jen will be the first to buy, and she's got a bunch of money, so you better bet she's going to spend some of that on getting some public support for our cause. But if you'd like to watch a little bit more of that, go on ahead and hit the button that's for extended play, and I'll play through at least two or three more rounds. I'll try to play at least long enough to where we can get into the um, middle phase of the game. We'll see how it goes. We're going to hit the other button for final thoughts. Your choice in five, four, three, two, one.